Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this IISS Asia event at the Fullerton Hotel. I'm Tim Huxley, the Executive Director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies Asia. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's IISS Fullerton Lecture. It is the seventh in this year's series in this iconic venue in the heart of Singapore's financial district. It's wonderful to see such a large uh, audience here this evening on a day which is significant for other reasons uh, than this event at the Fullerton Hotel. I think this very full room here tonight indicates the importance of our lecturer and the, the topic that he will address. I'm delighted today to welcome Jean-Claude Juncker, Prime Minister of Luxembourg and President of the Euro Group, who has come to Singapore on his way back from the ASEM Summit in Vientiane. And we're very grateful for him uh, taking the time to speak uh, at this event this evening. Thank you very much. Mr. Juncker is the longest serving head of government of any European Union state. Indeed, he is the longest serving democratically elected head of any government in the world. He was, <laughs> he was elected to the Chamber of Deputies for the Christian Social People's Party in 1984. He immediately joined Luxembourg's cabinet as Minister for Work. He was Minister of Finance from 1989 to 2009 and Prime Minister from 1995. As Prime Minister, he has done much to raise Luxembourg's international profile. But equally importantly, he has championed the cause of European integration in its social as well as its economic dimension. As Luxembourg's Prime Minister, he has twice served as President of the European Council in 1997 and again in 2005. In 2005, he also assumed the presidency of the Eurogroup, which exercises political control over the euro currency. And so he's been at the center of efforts to resolve the euro crisis. Famously, he said last year that the seriousness of monetary policy issues implied that dark secret debates were necessary in the euro group. I think it's fair to say that Mr. Juncker is a visionary enthusiast for the broad project of European integration. While many voices, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, have cast doubt on the viability of the euro and even of the European Union as it is presently constructed, this is an extremely opportune time to hear from a distinguished and respected politician who has been and, who has been and remains close to the heart of the European project. Prime Minister, we are really honored by your presence here this evening to deliver the latest lecture in the IISS Fullerton series, and we look forward to hearing you speak on the theme, the Euro, an asset for Europe, and an opportunity for Asia. The floor is yours, sir. Ministers, Minister, Ambassadors, Chair, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a great uh, pleasure indeed for me to be here and to deliver the uh, seventh uh, lecture. I come to you from attending the ASEM meeting in uh, Laos, where the overarching theme was Friends for Peace, Partners for Prosperity. And I hope to develop both elements of this team in today's uh, discussion of the Euro. When a room is so full of uh, such distinguished guests here to consider the future of the Euro, a currency whose closest systematic uh, users are 8,000 kilometers away and whose uh, central bank is another 2,000 beyond that, then you have cause to believe that the topic is an important one. 
when that distinguished crowd is assembled on the day of the American presidential elections, you know it's not only important, but it is also serious. I hope to convey, convey to you today my very strong belief that while the topic is, of course, an extremely serious one, it is absolutely not the seriousness of imminent catastrophe, as has often been portrayed in the media, nor is it the seriousness of uh, fundamental incompatibilities between Euro area member states, as has also been suggested. These make for very dramatic headlines, as well as for dramatic predictions over the Euro's future. But these predictions are wrong, as most predictions are. The seriousness I want to talk about is rather the commitment that the European Union has shown over so many years to building a political and economic community and an economic and monetary union and to deliver peace and prosperity to its people. Also to extend the promise of that peace and prosperity to those which who wish to become members and to develop relations based on the same principles to those beyond the EU borders. For me, this is what is embodied by the ASEAN summit, and for me, this is what drives the European Union. Of course, the European Union has moved beyond a purely economic construction, and it will need to move further along the road towards more political and civil integration. I will come to that shortly. But first of all, I want to spend a moment reflecting on the original concept underlying European uh, integration. That concept is first and uh, foremost the avoidance of armed conflict. And to achieve that, the pursuit of shared economic interests and through the pursuit of those shared interests, the broadening of the avoidance of conflict into the creation of a positive common interest, both political and economic. And thus the creation of a virtuous circle of the achievement of mutually beneficial economic objectives, delivering greater prosperity to all. We arrive at the point where we have moved so far from our previous conflicts that we overdramatize all disagreements, all differences of emphasis in our shared political and economic approach. It may not be a fashionable or universally well-received opinion in a context of the problems we have experienced in the Euro area, but I would firmly place the Euro at the heart of the good work that the European Union has done and continues to do. I would pay tribute to the role of the Euro in helping the countries of Central and Eastern Europe reform and strengthen their economies over the last two decades. And I would claim a great deal of credit for the Euro as a key pillar of the European Union as a whole, which will as a whole, collect a Nobel Prize for peace next month. Of course, I'm aware that uh, some people have expressed surprise at the, the EU winning that prize. And I'm uh, aware that some have commented on the fact that its award comes at a time when tensions between member states seem to be more severe than they have been uh, for some time. I'm even aware that there have been some jokes about winning the prize for peace because we would never win the prize for economics. But uh, the uh, political context of Europe, both historical and present, and the political reality of the Euro is what we live with every day in the European Union. And it is what we need to make work every day. So we are unlikely to win any prizes for the academic neatness of the Euro area. But if we look at the Euro from the perspective of a political imperative to integrate our economic interests with the aim of delivering greater prosperity to our people, we can see some very real, very significant practical achievements. You can travel from Helsinki, Finland, to Lisbon, Portugal, from Athens, Greece, to Dublin, Ireland, from Nicosia, Cyprus, to Valletta, Malta, to Amsterdam, Netherlands. You can meet and do business with a market of more than 330 million people, all sharing a single currency. You can establish a business in Ljubljana, or in Rome, or in Paris, or in Madrid, and have direct access to all that market, those 
330 million customers without the need to work out exchange rate hedging strategies for 17 different currencies. You can choose Tallinn or Berlin, Vienna or Luxembourg, Brussels or Bratislava, and you can base your choice on the real needs of your business, safe in the knowledge that you have access to that whole market with its single currency and with its 330 million customers. And if you have a concern about the currency strategy you need to adopt, you can talk to the European Central Bank to be reassured on the commitment to price stability or other monetary issues. If you need guidance on the competition rules, you can talk to the European Commission. And for other euro area issues, you can talk, if I have time, to me. To me and to many nations and international organizations and thousands of businesses operating in Europe, that short list of people to talk to is no small achievement. It has taken us decades to get there. Of course, as we have found out over the last couple of years, that isn't quite enough. The spirit of our ever closer union and the expectation of continued economic convergence have not been sufficient to deliver the economic and monetary union we hoped for. But again, not achieving everything that we hoped for doesn't mean not achieving anything at all. The monetary union that we have has improved the functioning of our single market. And on even the most pessimistic assessment, it has taken us onto the road we have now embarked on where we can define the economic elements that will make a full economic and monetary union a reality. Not to forget the social elements of our political union. We have seen the establishment of stable exchange rates in the run-up to the launch of the Economic and Monetary Union and irrevocably fixed exchange rates uh, ever since, covering a period of uh, 20 years since the signature of the Maastricht Treaty. This, is, this in itself is unprecedented in European history and has delivered a level of economic stability that many of our member states never experienced before. We have seen a real shift in the way our governments manage their public finances. It may look at the moment as though some of our member states are facing real difficulties, and indeed they are. But the bigger picture is of a recognition of the need to plan for the long-term costs of our aging populations, and most of our member states are taking their responsibilities and introducing a combination of budgetary control and structural reform measures to ensure that public finances are sustainable in the long term. And all this with a very high level of social protection and increasing life expectancy. I'm not complacent. I'm not in denial about the weaknesses in our economic and social framework. But I do not think it is fair to say that we made no provision for these issues when we launched the Economic and Monetary Union. We made provisions. Our failure was perhaps one of excessive optimism. In particular, we overestimated the determination of governments to make the reforms necessary for the long term to ensure stability, uh, sustainability of public finances and a lasting convergence of economic performance. And, the, and we overestimated, in fact, the ability of governments to hold each other to account when many of them were faced with similar, similar difficulties. So here we are today still in a crisis, still facing uncertainty about the viability of the economic and budgetary plans of at least some of our member states, and therefore facing questions about the viability of the single currency itself. I cannot today deliver the answers to all the questions that have been raised. Nor can I dispel in one lecture the doubts that some people have about the single currency. What I can do is express to you my confidence that we are making progress along the path towards answering those questions. We are developing the solutions that can dispel the doubts and we are deepening the process of integration that was only partially completed through the creation 
of the single market and the single currency. When we achieved that deeper level of integration that was missing from the initial structures of economic and monetary union, what will emerge will be a stronger economic and monetary union, composed of stronger member states' economies with a much stronger framework for delivering future stability, prosperity, and social justice. So the euro will survive, for we are not facing a crisis of the euro. So what was missing from the initial blueprint? What went wrong in the economic and monetary union? And how are we going to fix it? Of course, I was closely implicated in the drafting of the provisions of the Maastricht Treaty on economic and monetary union. And I have been very closely implicated in their implementation ever since. So I find myself in a good position to know what we were trying to achieve, to see whether we did achieve it and to tell you where the fault lies if we didn't. So let me start with this. We, don't, we did not achieve all that we set out to achieve. This much is clear. Very specifically, we did not manage to ensure compliance in all member states with the guiding principles of Article 119 of the Maastricht Treaty, stable prices, sound public finances and monetary conditions and the sustainable balance of payments. We did, in fact, very well on stable prices at the aggregate level through the European Central Bank. We also did reasonably well on the other items at the aggregate level. However, our monetary union is made up by diverse economies. The mechanisms for continuing the process of convergence that have been so strictly monitored prior to the Euro adoption, these mechanisms were simply not strong enough and certainly not effective. Why was this? It uh, may have been through a misunderstanding of the full implications of being part of a monetary union, not only budgetary constraints, but also the need to manage potentially painful adjustments through the real economy, through wages, and through prices. And if not through this misunderstanding, it was brought, it, it was through a failure of political will to address fully the demands placed on government's policy by these constraints. Such a failure is understandable, perhaps, with an environment of low interest rates and some asset price bubbles. The pressure comes off the need for fundamental structural reform. It is hard to sell a consolidation message during a boom, just when it is most appropriate. The easy path, after the hard work of convergence for the euro adoption, was just too tempting. So, through both misunderstanding and political failings exacerbated by easy credit and the mispricing of risk, some of our member states run up very high debts while failing to reform their economies and adjust to globalization. They build up significant macroeconomic imbalances and the unwinding of these imbalances when the global financial crisis hit has been abrupt. In some cases, it has been more than abrupt and has resulted in the exclusion of sovereign borrowers from financial markets. That's the bad news. And it's pretty terrible news. Member states failed to pursue appropriate policies and our collective oversight failed properly to hold them to account. Bad policy choices were facilitated by cheap borrowing and the weak framework for economic policy surveillance and coordination. Because of this, we have indeed got into a terrible mess. But then comes the good news. Good news which fits with the Friends for Peace Partners for Prosperity Ethos, and which embodies the spirit of the European Union to seek to learn from previous mistakes, to offer support to those who need it in order to enable them to remain and develop as partners of prosperity. That good news is the response of the European Union, and more specifically of the Euro area and its member states to this crisis. While that response has been criticized by some extremely harshly, I would still regard it 
as an impressive display, firstly, of crisis management, secondly, of solidarity within the euro area, and thirdly, of a strong desire to rectify the failings in our institutional framework and in our past behavior. Klaus Regling, the managing director of uh, the European Stability Mechanism, came here a little over two months ago and spoke of how member states are going about to work of adjusting their budgetary and economic plans. I don't want to repeat what he said, but it is worth drawing attention one more time to the main headlines. Fiscal deficits are being brought down even in the difficult economic circumstances we are facing, including through radical reforms to labor markets, pension systems, and public administrations. This action will make our economies more resilient in the future and better adapted to the challenges of the globalized economy. The European Union is tackling macroeconomic imbalances in a way that it in the past failed to do. We have established specific procedures to identify and correct serious imbalances. And uh, we see that these are bearing fruit in those member states which saw their account, account deficits increase dramatically in recent years. In short, we are seeing progress in reversing the loss of competitiveness in some member states that followed the introduction of the single currency. And we are tackling the weakness uh, in our financial uh, sector by ensuring that banks increase their capital, intervening with official support if necessary. Now, while these are to a certain extent only the necessary reverses of past policy failures, and while some will say that they may in the short term actually have adverse effects on the growth profile of some member states, I still think that they are impressive. And what I find particular impressive as a politician is the way that these reforms are not just an immediate response to the crisis we find ourselves in. They are not just what we need to do to get through the next the new cycle or the next electoral cycle or even the next business cycle. No, each of these elements is accompanied by a solid institutional commitment to change the whole approach that we take to economic policy. While the world has chosen to focus on the disagreements and the difficulties within the euro area, the euro area itself and the European Union as a whole have actually managed to agree on a level of economic integration that has, has eluded us for decades, a level of integration that eluded us even in the optimism that followed the fall of the Berlin Wall as we were creating our single currency at that very moment. From an economic point of view, I see the euro as the unifying common interest that propels us to make the right economic choices for the long term, even in difficult times. For five good reasons, I'm very optimistic about the future of the euro area. Firstly, member states are taking their responsibilities to each other within the euro area much more seriously than ever before. The difficult discussions we have had demonstrate that there is solidarity, but there is also a strong requirement to behave responsibly within the European Monetary Union. Secondly, we are much more realistically self-critical as regards our own capacity as governments to take the right long-term decisions. And so we have constrained ourselves to do the right thing. We have a fiscal compact under which each member state will adopt a balanced budget rule and automatic budgetary correction mechanism. We have strengthened our EU surveillance procedures, both for budgets and for macroeconomic imbalances. It is very tempting as a group of finance ministers to be a little too understanding of each other's problems. We may be too ready to accept the logic of the easy short-term solution which postpones those problems into the future. And so we have toughened up the procedures to remove that temptation. And thirdly, we've shown a remarkable degree of solidarity in developing financial support mechanism for those in need of them. 
first and ad hoc set a bilateral loan to Greece. Then a temporary joint vehicle for financial support, which has provided assistance for Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. And finally, coming into being only a month ago, the permanent European stability mechanism with a standing capacity of 500 billion euros. Governments, parliaments, ultimately the citizens of the euro area have shown their solidarity with those in difficulties in other member states, while also insisting on the economic reforms that are the basis of a return to longer term uh, prosperity. I have to say on the creation of the European stability uh, mechanism that I'm impressed. I'm impressed by the resolve of Euro member states to find solutions to serious problems on issues that they approach from very different directions. And I'm also surprised by the representation of agreements on those issues after long negotiations as evidence of partial disharmony. I chair these negotiations and I can tell you that I find the very fact that they are taking place a great reassurance of the common will of our member states to act in the collective interests of the euro area. The fact that they produce very clear, tangible outcomes agreed upon by all is a remarkable testament of the, to the ability of the euro area to do what is necessary when times are hard. And the fourth uh, element that gives me cause for optimism is the very real progress we are making in the financial sector. In particular, the firm commitment to break the vicious circle between banks and uh, sovereigns and to establish a single European supervision mechanism under the auspices of the European uh, Central Bank. Our timetable for agreeing on the necessary legislation by the end of the year is extremely ambitious and an indication of our determination to make things happen. Once that mechanism is in operation, we will have the possibility to recapitalize banks directly through the European stability mechanism. A weak banking sector need no longer provoke the weakness of a sovereign. This is probably the right point at which to highlight the role of the European Central Bank. It is the essential institution created as part of the Economic and Monetary Union, and it is an institution that has always served the interests of the European Union extremely well. It has the credibility and trust to take on the supervision role for the whole euro area. And it has demonstrated excellent guidance and leadership in the financial crisis. Its decision to embark on a policy of outright monetary transactions, to ensure the transmission of its monetary policy and signal to markets its determination to see financial support programs work, this intervention has been decisive in providing a strong and credible backstop for the euro and will continue to be so. And the fifth and final element in my tour of optimism around the euro is less about how we deal with the crisis and more about how we prepare to face the future. This element is the discussion about deepening integration in the euro area, beyond the banking union, beyond the establishment of financial firewalls and beyond the reforms to our surveillance procedures already agreed. We are discussing at the very highest political level and in the most fundamental terms what structures we do need in the euro area. We are engaging in a very open way in a discussion of what we need to make our economic and monetary union both stable and prosperous. And this includes a clear commitment to more extensive sharing of sovereignty. That is no longer absolute uh, anyway. More collective responsibility for economic policy decisions and more systematic consideration of the impact across the euro area of policies decided by individual member states. What kind of agreement we come to on budgetary and uh, economic policy frameworks will be much clearer over the next month or so. But what I take away already is the determination to hold that uh, discussion, to really engage with each other 
in a debate on who should make decisions and to what extent we need to deepen our reflection on shared economic interests within the euro area. This really is about how the euro area will move from the European Union's overall founding principle along the lines of France for peace to real and much deeper partnership for prosperity, not just on a country by country basis, but as a unified economic and social entity. I see economic and monetary union as much more than just a single currency. I see it as much more than just a single monetary policy. I see it as much more than a set of rules and obligations. I see the euro as the most important practical and symbolic achievement of European integration over the last 60 years as the primary tool and driver of deeper integration over the next 60 years, as the unifying force that makes real our shared endeavors in the pursuit of prosperity, peace, and political union. Euro is our money, our currency, the collective expression of the political and the economic strength of our continent. It is a fundamental value that we hold in common. And as a matter of fact, it is foremost a daily peace project. As much we will need to meet the increasing challenges of our collective responsibility for it. But with the actions that we've undertaken, I'm confident we will indeed meet those challenges that will exceed the expectations, not only of the pessimists, but even of the optimists about the future of the euro. The reforms that we are undertaking mean not only that the euro will remain a strong and stable currency serving a market of, uh, 300, uh, of more than 300 million citizens. These uh, reforms mean that the member states within that market will work together to ensure that public finances are sound and sustainable, that economic policies enhance competitiveness, and that our economies are fit for the future. The reforms already implemented in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, in Ireland, not to mention those implemented in other member states which do not need financial support, will make their economies more resilient and adaptable. Our further innovations in economic policy making will reinforce the obligation to ensure our economies continue to become more resilient and adaptable. Further integration will mean that global partners will be able to talk to the European Central Bank, not only about monetary policy, but also about banking supervision. I know that the European Stability Mechanism is already talking to many investors around the world about the opportunities it may offer to invest in a common asset for the euro area as a whole. Above all, the reforms we are undertaking will surely lead to the euro area becoming a more stable and a more reliable partner for all parts of the world, for trade and for investment. The economy of the euro area will not only be more robust in the future, but also more open. And this more open euro area economy will also become larger as more member states join. It seems fashionable to, at the moment to draw big distinctions between the euro area and the European Union in some quarters to question whether the single market can really be maintained if economic integration in the euro area deepens. I reject this uh, distinction. I insist that the single market of our 27 tomorrow, 28 uh, member states is of course, one of the fundamental achievements of the European Union and must continue to be one of its cornerstones. But I also insist that uh, the euro is the currency of the European Union as a whole. Over time, almost all our member states will join, thus deepening our single market and presenting an even, an even more unified economic area for the rest of the world to do business with. I'm very pleased to say that uh, Asia and the European Union are already extremely significant partners, both for trade and for investment 
And I can reaffirm after the Azam summit for peace, for friendship, and for prosperity. Asia is Europe's largest external trade partner. Great flows of goods and services are growing again after the global slowdown of 08 and 09. Stocks of foreign direct investments of Asia in the EU and the EU and of the EU in Asia now amount to over a trillion euro. The level of cooperation between the European Union and Asia is also increasing in a very positive way. A full free trade agreement between the European Union and South Korea has been in operation for one year and negotiations with a number of Asian partners as well as with the ASEAN as a whole are ongoing and there is a determined effort to move for, towards finalizing agreements with Singapore and India in the next future. With the ASEAN meetings at both finance minister and summit level, with uh, relations between the European Union and ASEAN and bilateral relations between the European and the Asian nations being developed further, I envisage a deepening of ties on all levels, political, economic and cultural. And I foresee the economic health of the Euro area as closely intertwined with that of its global partners, of whom Asia represents the largest. Based on my optimistic assessment of the developments currently underway in the Euro area, I can only conclude that now is a very good time for Asia to be open to greater, to greater partnership with Europe. It is a very good time to take advantage of the reforms taking place and the opportunities that they offer for both trade and investment. The Euro area has experienced difficulties. This is true. Those difficulties are not entirely overcome. That is for certain. But we have taken great strides to tackle our problems, not by turning inwards and erecting hurdles to protect our domestic markets, but by pursuing even more integration amongst our own member states and greater openness to our partners around the world. In taking this approach, the Euro area is delivering three key messages, both to its own citizens and to the world. Firstly, we recognize the political and economic imperative to implement the short, medium and long-term measures required to make the Euro work as it should, and we are determined to do what is required. Secondly, we will build the institutional framework to deepen integration within the Euro area so that it becomes more recognizably a single economic entity rather than a set of disparate econo economies sharing a currency. And thirdly, that the Euro area as an economic entity will prosper in partnership with others around the world. The interconnections of globalization bind us all, and it is through openness and greater cooperation that we can all become genuine partners in prosperity. The history of the European Union has been of 60 years of building peace and prosperity in the spirit of openness and cooperation. We have seen many political upheavals. And now we are living through a period of great financial and economic turmoil. I'm confident that the European Union and the Euro will emerge from this turmoil stronger and fitter for the challenges ahead. And together, we'll overcome this current crisis. I'm also confident that the spirit of partnership between Asia and Europe that I have experienced over recent days will lead us to greater cooperation, deeper friendship and success in our collective endeavors to increase our people's uh, prosperity. For Helmut Schmidt, the former German Chancellor, is absolutely right in saying that we are global neighbors. I would add good global neighbors in an ever smaller world. We cannot afford to miss the historical Eurasian opportunity of our time. Thank you for listening. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Uh, you've provided an extremely clear assessment of the significance of the European project, the causes of the Euro crisis, and the measures being taken to 
resolve the crisis, the ambitious measures being taken, um, and at the same time to build a stronger and more resilient monetary union. And also you've, you've talked about the economic importance of Europe and Asia for each other. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions from our audience. We have approximately 15 minutes for exchanges between yourself and those who wish to ask questions. If you do uh, want to ask a question, please remain in your seat, raise your hand, the microphone will come to you uh, once I've recognized you. And could I ask that you please identify yourself and your organization and please keep your question as, as brief as you can and, and as much to the point as you can. Uh, who will ask the first question? Sir. Mr. Juncker, yeah. um, my name is Tan Keng Soon. I'm from the Tan Ing Kiam Foundation. My question is this. A wise man once said, we all know what to do, but we don't know how to get re-elected after we've done it. So the, re the reforms that the EU is asking the Greeks and other countries like Spain and Portugal to do are politically unpopular. Do you think that uh, is, is possible? It will be successful. Thank you. As you are quoting a wise man I'm very familiar with, I have to draw your attention to the fact that I'm in office for more than 17 years. And it was said by the chair that uh, from a worldwide perspective, uh, I'm the longest democratically elected politician. So the quote you have mentioned um, uh, doesn't apply to all uh, politicians. Uh, but were I in Greece and had I to undertake the reforms the Greeks have to go through, you, can, you cannot be popular because these are strong, huge, rigorous uh, austerity measures, but uh, our Greek friends don't have uh, a different option or another choice. They have to do it. And uh, my uh, impression is that um, the reforms which are uh, undertaken in Greece uh, are increasingly better understood by the Greek uh, uh, citizens. So I'm very optimistic when it comes uh, uh, to Greece because I do think that the now government is taking seriously uh, on its shoulders uh, the reform program which could have been implemented decades and years before. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Sir. Good evening, uh, Prime Minister. I'm Don Hanna from Fortress Investment Group. Thank you very much for the very thought out and uh, uh, very eloquent presentation of the strategy that you're following, in particularly the focus on adjustment. I wondered if you could tell me, uh, though, how the accumulation of trade surpluses in Germany, which is now, in dollar terms, the largest in the world, and rising as a share of German GDP, contributes to this adjustment that we see in the other areas. So the imbalance is not just always a deficit, but it's sometimes a surplus. As uh, Polonius, as Shakespeare said, through the mouth of Polonius in his Hamlet play, neither a borrower nor a lender be, for, for loans off lose both money and friends and borrowing leads to uh, Dahl's husbandry. Thank you. It's an, uh, an easy, difficult, complicated uh, question. In fact, we are experiencing major imbalances inside the euro area, and these imbalances, uh, they are broadening. They were broadening before the start of the crisis, and now they are a little bit narrowing, but nevertheless, the, the, the general performance is not an, uh, an outstanding one. Germany very often is, is criticized by those who are less performant for its surpluses. And I do think that the surpluses do constitute a real problem by comparison to the deficits of uh, others. But uh, I'm not part of that group of politicians who are inviting the Germans to reconsider the reforms they have uh, 
undertaken in order to improve uh, their uh, competitiveness. I'm, I'm trying to provoke others to do the same thing, not the same measures, but the same, uh, trying to, 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 to achieve uh, the same results. As a matter of fact, and this is no longer controversial inside Germany, uh, Germany has to uh, bring a, to give a stronger focus to the internal uh, consumption. As Germany does have these uh, uh, positive uh, margins, I do think that uh, Germany would be best advised and it would be in the interest of the whole euro area if the internal consumption would increase, which would not have as an effect that others uh, would be uh, would no longer be encouraged to, to undertake the structural reforms they have uh, uh, to undertake. And one should not try to reduce this problem to a, a Franco-German relation. It's, it's a broader uh, problem. And um, as a matter of fact, we did uh, underestimate the impact of uh, the uh, losses of competitiveness since uh, the euro was uh, uh, introduced, because Greece and Portugal and to some extent, Ireland and Spain have lost between 20 and 25 percent of their competitiveness. If we would have given the same importance to the fight against the losses in competitiveness than the one we have given to the fight against the budget deficit, we would not be in uh, the situation we are in for the time being. So. Evening, Prime Minister. Thank you for speaking with us. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm the Chief Editor of the AsianObserver.com. Um, I have one question for you, um, because the topic today is about the euro and how it's been an asset for Europe and an opportunity for Asia. So my question basically is, um, what is the role that you see for Singapore and Southeast Asia in helping uh, with uh, what you have planned for Europe and bringing the imbalances and all this um, into play? What is the role for Southeast Asia, particularly Singapore, that you see us playing um, regarding as allies? We are very grateful for Singapore and for other countries in the region uh, for having supported the euro in the way Singapore and other countries have uh, done it. We, we, are, we feel uh, very comfortable with uh, the intentions of uh, the governments of the region and of uh, Singapore to um, yeah, to give proofs of solidarity towards uh, the EU uh, area. I do think that uh, the best thing our partners here in the region could do would be to contradict those who are uh, masters in Euro bashing. So I think that Singapore uh, would be a good address uh, to um, bring an answer to the Anglo-Saxon way of um, trying to kill a currency which will not be killed. On that note, Prime Minister, I'd like to ask you a question myself. Um, uh, it's about the, the future place in the EU of, of those countries which are not part of the monetary union at the moment, and how do you how do you envisage the, the position of, of those states, particularly the UK, evolving in the future? We, we have uh, different kinds of non-members. Yes. Uh, 20 out of 27 members, in fact, are willing to interview the EU at the very day they are uh, fulfilling the so-called convergence uh, criteria, Sweden being a, a the case apart. Britain and Denmark uh, have opted for an opting uh, out, and so they are the, the, these are the so-called derogation countries. So if these two countries will not change their mind, and if they will go on with the, the, the opting out uh, uh, clause, they will become 
and to some extent they are in that situation regional, if not local castes. It's better to be part of a strong international recognized uh, currency than being uh, the owner of a regional or local currency. Thank you very much. One more question at the back. Mr. Prime Minister, since the austerity measures are not popular, is there a growing likelihood that the ECB will decide to print more money and buy up all the debt that these, these uh, southern tier countries uh, have? Thank you. Fortunately for the ECB, I'm not the president of that bank. I'm never giving public advice to the European Central Bank, so you can try it once again, but it won't work. Prime Minister, thank you for your, your really good answers to that range of questions um, from the audience. I think your, your lecture and, and your answers um, have given us a, a clearer idea about where the euro is going and uh, the nature of the challenges that still face European states and the EU as they grapple with what you uh, have referred to as a terrible mess. Um, I think one particularly important fact that you highlighted is that at its core, the, the European Union embodies a commitment by its member states to entrench in Europe stability and security based on common prosperity. It is, uh, as I think you, you implied, in essence, a, a peace project. And having heard you speak this evening, I think there's no doubting the commitment to, of those at the center of the crisis, not only to resolve the crisis, but also to continue building the European project, which you and many, many others are determined shall not fail. So thank you again very sincerely for presenting this seventh Fullerton lecture this evening on this crucial topic and for responding to our questions and engaging in discussion with us. Thank you, thank you very much, sir.